of the Senior Symposium of 2018. Uh, today we have Nicholas Benedetto, Nicholas Reist, Reist I apologize, and Brendan Colton. Um, they're presenting the indoor localization for healthcare facilities via Wi-Fi and the Internet of Things, Edge Nodes, and their uh, capstone advisor was Dr. Samuel Tawab. Good luck, guys. Is um is one Sean second. Coming? Yeah. Are we waiting for anybody no. else? No more. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Um. The computer's been acting weird. Supposedly, so I'm trying to make sure it's set up and not going to shut down all this. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicholas Benedetto. Brendan Colton. And Nicholas Reese. And today we're going to be presenting to you our indoor localization system for healthcare facilities using IoT and Wi Fi. And it's better known as Locate. So, just as an introduction, we're going to be going over the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is basically talking about any device that is connected to the Internet. So, when we talk about IoT devices, we could be talking about smart fridges, smart TVs, um, autonomous vehicles, and other wearable IoT. So for example, wearable IoT could be a Fitbit, Apple Watch, heart rate monitor that sends things over the internet and things of that nature. So we're gonna be presenting to you today our system and our solution that is a wearable IoT device. And just for quick numbers, we can see that in 2015, it was estimated that there were about 15.4 billion IoT devices in the world. And by 2020, that number is supposed to swell to 75 billion. So IoT is on the rise, and that's why we chose to use IoT in our project. All right, so defining the problem of a project. Last September, we were approached by Mr. Sean Craddock from Centaur RMH, the local hospital right down the road. And he had a handful of problems that he wanted us to try to address with our system. The first issue was that they have a lot of staff. It's a very large facility, and the staff is constantly moving around, doctors, nurses, very busy workload. And they had issues sometimes locating someone on short notice, so they wanted a, a manager, per se, to be able to locate where their nurse was immediately and go and find them and tell them that they needed them at another place or to check out another patient. Another issue was the loved ones going through the medical process. They were not always their status was not always relayed back to their family um, in a timely manner or accurately. So they wanted to make sure that the family was able to sit in the waiting room, say for surgery, and know when their loved one has left the surgery and gone to recovery and when they can go and see them. And finally, we had to keep being discreet, private, and secure at the forefront of this project because medical information is very private, very um, confidential, and we want to make sure that it does not fall into the wrong hands. So to address these problems, we created LOCATE, uh, short for Localization of Healthcare Assets Through an IoT Environment. Our initial goals for LOCATE involve creating lightweight, compact IoT devices using relatively low cost components. Uh, we envisioned that these devices would be small enough to fit in a pocket or uh, wear, be worn around the wrist. Um, additionally, uh, we, tried, we attempted to keep the overall cost of our system as low as possible to provide a realistic uh, possibility of a scalable future. And finally, we ensured that uh, the components used in our devices provided a high degree of reliability, particularly in battery life and connectivity. So this diagram is our system architecture. So this is what we're basically going to be going over with you today. So first, we're going to start with our actual edge node devices and how they're going to be located within a building using Wi-Fi access points. And then from there, we're going to show how our information and data is sent to the Amazon cloud, how it's stored, and how we're actually going to use that data. And then from then on, we're going to show how our iOS and web application will actually display that data in near real time. All right, so our edge node. As we have here, we have two working prototypes of our edge nodes. We'll pass those around really quick. So the edge node, the reason why it's called an edge node is because all the computing is done on the device. So that means that the load is taken off the servers and it cuts down on costs and it allows for a lot more flexibility in what you can do with the system. So there are four main components to each of our nodes. First is Raspberry Pi 0W and that is a smaller version of its predecessor, Raspberry Pi 3. And that is a small computer that also has a built-in wireless interface. And after tinkering with that for a little bit, you were able to make that interface recognize all the access points within a certain area, within its signal area, and collect information from them. Second part is the compact lithium battery. That battery is important because, as we mentioned before, we want a small and lightweight product. 
and they also have a lot uh, to offer for their size compared to their um, power and their battery life. The third part is the uh, LiPo battery connector shim, and that is important because the Raspberry Pi out of the box is a very basic computer, and you have to attach certain um, like components to it in order to connect the battery. And the fourth part is a built-in, or I'm sorry, a non-built-in mini USB wireless dongle. And that is because although you can use the built-in interface to monitor, you also need a second interface to constantly push the data you are collecting to our web service uh, database. So now that Brendan's gone over some of the physical aspects of our edge node, we're gonna start going into the processes that are actually running on those edge nodes. So first, as Brendan said, we have to put in the built-in interface into monitoring mode. And what that does is it allows us to see packets and see information that we need to allow it to track. So if we go to the next slide, we're actually gonna go more into depth. So we can see um, on the upper right-hand corner is an actual packet from Wireshark. And for those of you who don't know, Wireshark is a packet sniffer, so pretty much between information such as Wi-Fi or Ethernet cables, we're able to see information that is actually sent um, over the communication source. So we can see that we're using 802.11 beacon frames to actually um, like locate our edge node devices. And within those beacon frames, there's a signal strength. So basically what a signal strength is, is um, the signal strength shows how far you are away from these access points. So if we look up here, this is an actual example of an access point in this building. And if I were closer to it, it would show a lower signal strength. So usually signal strength, we um, measure anywhere between negative 20 and negative 100 dBm. And the closer you are, as I said, the lower that number will be. So if I backed away from this access point, theoretically, my signal strength should be higher. And that's how we're ultimately going to uh, that's what we're ultimately going to use to track these edge node devices. And um, besides that, each access point actually gives off a different frequency. So we're actually going to need to channel hop to be able to see each of these frequencies throughout a single building. So for example, in this screenshot above, we can see that the access point we're using to test had channel six as its channel, but we can see from this figure below that there are 14 different channels that each of these access points can actually be set to. So we need to channel hop frequently throughout our monitoring to actually see each of these access points, and that makes our system more accurate and reliable for us to see the tracking information accurately. Okay, so moving on, once we have that information, we need to take the, from the beacon frame, the specific key points that we need. And so that is done by T-Shark. And T-Shark is able to collect this data and then put it into a text file. And from that text file, we use Python scripts to parse the information to get specifically what we need and then push it along to our AWS database. So moving on one slide, we can see in the top left corner a text file that T-Shark is providing for us. And in that text file, we can see we have date, so your time zone, so Eastern Standard Time for here, then your MAC address, and your signal strength. So a MAC address, that is a unique identifier to every electronic device. So the access points within a facility, they're all gonna have a MAC address and that's not going to be changing. And that is why you use those because you know that that is gonna be in the stationary location and always be there as long as it's turned off. And so then the signal strength, as Nick said, it's in DBM. We can't really tell you how far away you are like with DBM, you need to convert that to feet, something people understand or meters or something. So if we look at the bottom right, we have our Python script. The top part, as I said, is parsing the information from the text file. And then right here, if you look at this line, D equals, and then this big long string of numbers, that is where we're taking D, which is the signal strength, and putting it through an equation that we figured out for this specific building to um, convert from signal strength to feet away from an access point. After that, we're able to take all the key variables, being time, uh, MAC address, and then feet, and push it all the database, and then from there you're able to pull it from the web application or iOS application to see where people are as long as they have a note on. So, moving forward, this is how we figured out that equation that was in the Python script. So this is all local to this building. If we were to go to another building, we would have to conduct this test once again. So if we were to move to Centaur RMH, because our access points might be different, and the environment around, the materials around, will affect signal strength, you have to adjust for that facility. So what we did was we took a number of trials from 1, 5, 10, 15, and so on feet, and we tested the signal strength from that distance over in the engineering and geoscience third floor, just down the hall. And from that, we were able to develop a line of best fit, and we took the equation from that and put it into Python, and therefore, if you put in the signal strength, you're able to then get feet, which gives you your distance away from a certain access point. 
So now that we know how this signal strength is actually converted to a distance that we can use to track our edge nodes, we can actually plot this onto a map. So this floor plan is actually the engineering and geoscience third floor, so it's right down the hallway in the engineer geoscience building. And this is where our testing environment was. So we, we were using all the uh, access points in that building for our actual testing. So if you can see on this uh, floor plan, there are actually green circles where each of these access points is in a given room. And that's how we were actually going to display our data on our web app and iOS app um, to show where an edge node was at a specific time. If you can see to the right, this is an example of what's in our database. So we needed to actually map each of these access points to an X and Y coordinate on the floor plan so we could accurately locate our edge nodes. And we can see that, as Brandon said before, there's a unique MAC ID. So it's a unique identifier that no one access point will have the same as another one in another building or room. So those are going to be used to actually show where these edge nodes are. And we'll go more into detail mm -hmm. during our demo. Uh, so, as I mentioned previously, we made a continuous effort uh, to keep costs low throughout the entire process of building our solution. Uh, because of this, we decided to uh, store our data collected by the edge nodes uh, in the Amazon Web Services cloud. So, on the left, uh, you can see a common configuration for data storage used by uh, <coughs> many mobile and web-based applications. Uh, the, an application running on a user's computer or mobile phone uh, requests resources from a web server for many of its functions. The web server uh, utilizes data stored in a database uh, to supply these requests. Oftentimes, the, uh, the database and the web server will be, uh, will be stored together. However, the database is uh, often uh, the, the first to uh, be stored on separate physical hardware uh, when scalability becomes a priority. Um, rather than purchasing our own servers, we, uh, we decided to use instances of uh, Amazon's Elastic Cloud Computing and Relational Database Services to act as our web server and database servers, respectively. Um, so, as Nick, as Nick said, we created both an iOS and web application to display the data stored in the cloud. Our uh, iOS application was created with X, uh, using uh, the Swift programming language and Xcode, uh, the Mac OS integrated development environment. Uh, also critical to the development process was Alamo Fire, a Swift-based HTTP networking library, and CocoaPods, uh, an application-level dependency manager. So, uh, our iOS application is in its uh, alpha stage. And in its current form, uh, features data retrieved from a database, from our database, uh, protected by a layer of user authentication. And um, also, a user is able to perform some basic administrative functions, which we will now demonstrate. So this is uh, the, the initial view for our iOS application. It provides us the user authentication service. So we're going to test this user authentication by first pressing the login without entering a username and password. You see it gives us a message to enter a username and password. Next, we're going to enter an incorrect or unauthenticated username and password combination, which will receive invalid username or password. Finally, we're going to uh, correct an authenticated username and password combination, which is checkout, checkout. So uh, once we're granted access to the application, you'll see there's a list of patients uh, and also a list of staff and nodes. These are, all, these are pulled from our database. Uh, you can see that we have four active nodes currently uh, during this demonstration. So what we do next is add a patient and associate it with a specific node. So we're going to add new patient uh, and associate with the node 4.1. Uh, once this node, this uh, once we save this, it updates the database. So it is displayed both in our application and our database. Um, as you can see, uh, in in cases where the list is heavily populated, we've added a search functionality, so a user can identify a specific patient, uh, find what node it's associated with. Uh, and find the distance from it, uh, at a, a location using the nodes table. Uh, finally, a user is able to uh, delete patients from the list of patients. So now that we've gone over our iOS application, we're going to go over our web application we made. So this application can be run in any browser. It could be on a PC, Mac, tablet, or phone. So the way we built this web application was with Bootstrap. So for those of you that, uh, that don't know, Bootstrap is a front-end framework that actually uses HTML, CSS, and JavaScript repositories to create components that are easy to use and that create easy, um, uh, easy usability for web applications. 
So once we built this web application, we obviously needed functionality to actually show the data and show it on a map like we showed you earlier. And to do that, we used a combination of the scripting language PHP and a JavaScript plugin, CanvasJS. And what those do is actually allow us to graph that floor plan on the actual web app, and it allows us to see those edge nodes on a specific location. So we'll actually show you a demo, but before we start, we're gonna go over a little scenario that would actually play out in real life in a healthcare facility. So for example, say Brennan just got out of surgery and he's my brother and I wanted to go in and see where he actually was located in the hospital. I would go to the receptionist um, at the front desk and I would ask him, uh, him or her what node number is associated with Brendan. And after I showed them proper proof that I actually was his brother and I was related to them or to him, they would give me a node ID so that I could actually go onto this website and search. So I would go in the lobby, they would have either PCs or tablets that I would be able to actually log in as a guest and I would just click login. And then um, the node ID they gave for me in this case is gonna be 3.1. So we can see that there are other nodes up on the map and these just represent other patients or nurses that are being tracked with our edge nodes. So as I said before, we're gonna be tracking node 3.1 because that is associated with Brendan. So we're gonna be seeing him go around this floor plan and him actually being located. And each place he moves, there's gonna be an image popping up showing the room number. And obviously, I don't know if you guys are, will be able to see, but the number is also associated with that number on the floor plan. Um, so we can also see there is a table view in our web application that corresponds with the uh, map view. So either way, it'll show you the data that is being displayed. And we can see that this data gives you the node ID and then it'll have a diameter circle corresponding with the access point to show how far the edge node is away from one of these access points. So we can see Brendan has moved from his starting location down the hallway to the left to room 3123. And throughout this process, that circle will be getting bigger or smaller, corresponding with one of these distances from the location. As we said before, we're using the signal strength to track the distance and convert it. Um, the next place Brendan will be moving, we're gonna be seeing the circle grow a little bit bigger, and he'll be moving from this location to room 310. And once he moves there, I'm gonna tell you about the radius and how the tracking is actually gonna be. And then we'll talk about further how it can be um, built upon in future. So we can see that the circle is a little bit bigger than before. And that's just because the access point for that particular um, location was farther inside the room. So say for example, this access point was, is all the way in this room and he was out in the hallway. That circle is showing big because he is out in the hallway and it is corresponding with a bigger distance of 28 feet. So the closer you are to a given access point, the more accurate the system will be. And we can finally see that he moved down here and his circle is really small now because he was standing under a specific access point. So when we go to the table view, we can see that he was only seven feet away from that access point. So he can only be in a seven foot uh, radius around that given access point. So that shows how accurate our system can be while only using one access point to locate at a time. And we can see uh, fluctuations between these circles just because, just because signal strength isn't a constant. It always fluctuates and it's always changing. And we can finally see he ended up uh, outside an auditorium and that's gonna be his final place. And then once we check the table again to make sure he is in the right place, we're gonna go to the home page and then log out. So those are all the functional functionalities of our web app. And now we'll move to our future work to show what else we, will build, we would build upon if we were to continue this project. So continuing this project in the future, there's a lot of things to do. So long-term testing and implementation, we were able to test here in the engineering or geoscience building, third floor, but what would be ideal is if we were able to take it to some Terra RMH or another healthcare facility, attach it to nurses and patients for long periods of time, say a month, gather all the data, make sure that our system is working properly, make sure that the people who we are building the system for some Terra RMH is happy with the product. We were not able to do that, but that would be uh, the biggest goal we would have. In addition, security and privacy. So we touched on security and privacy, but there's a lot more to do. So handing it off to another group, maybe next year, they can go more in depth and try to penetrate the system and make it more hardened. We have data analysis, analysis and scalability. As I mentioned before, edge nodes have a lot of computing power. They're able to do a lot, they can store the data. So with the data of people moving around, you might be able to create a new hospital layout floor plan that is better suited for your current environment than the one you're in now. So you can take the historical data and apply it to a lot of different things. System accuracy. 
as we stated, we do have fluctuation and we are within a rough estimate of distance. The ideal final product would have triangulation, but that is not always possible due to scarcity of access points. So here, the access points are kind of spread out. Since our arm age, they're also very spread out. So if you don't have enough access points within a locale, <coughs> you will not have a signal strength or distance to actually talk to three, which is the number you would need for triangulation. Then we also have increased application functionality. Obviously, we have an alpha version of our iOS app and a very basic web application. And we would love to reach into the Android world and also to spruce up the other two. And you can always make improvements on that as technology is changing. And finally, energy consumption. We have a small battery and that's great, but we did not get a chance to test the battery life and that's something that's critical because you can't have this failing because if you lose track of a patient, that's gonna be a big problem. So we need to ensure before we actually start using this in a real world application that we have a very reliable battery that's going to last long enough and have enough power to uh, be used with our node. Finally, we'd like to thank a number of people. First off is Dr. Samuel Swab, our project advisor. He has worked with us since September, actually since last year, and we could not have done it without him. He has been a great help. A lot of suggestions got us in touch with RMH and gave us the project idea. Mr. Sean Craddock actually came to Dr. Altuab and us and gave us the idea and gave us a place to like, have a goal for. So we really want to thank him. And we got to go to Center Tower RMH and look around and kind of get an idea of how this might be implemented. We also have 4VA, they're continuing the funding of the project starting this spring. Dr. Emil Salib, who is another telecommunication networking security professor in ISAT. I would not have been able to get the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero into monitor mode without his help, so as always, he's been amazing. And Tyler Hartman, a JMU senior, who is um, one of our classmates, he helped me with soldering the Raspberry Pis to the shims. I burned myself and I broke a number of things and we would not have had a final product if it wasn't for Tyler, and I probably would have burned down the entire building. <laughs> We'd also like to uh, thank Mr. Safa, our lovely TNS man, uh, lab manager, uh, for providing us with much of the necessary equipment. Uh, Cole Bradley, um, a JMU computer science uh, graduate, he provided the uh, floor plans and uh, access point locations for the NGO building. Uh, our classmate Claire Folk, uh, for designing the logos and titles used uh, in our applications. And finally, Dylan McAllister, who graduated last year uh, for um, providing the proof of concept for this project uh, in his capstone. That concludes our, um, our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Are the nodes attached to the patient, and how are they attached? So, they would be attached to the patient. So they're small enough. Um, were you able to see one now? Yeah. Okay. So they're small enough that you can fit in a pocket. Obviously, that might be an issue because, you know, patients, they're probably wearing, um, what are they called? The gowns. Gowns. The gowns, yes. <laughs> so you may not have a pocket. Ideally, um, what we're thinking is a lanyard. So that's pretty unintrusive. It can flow about. You know, you never know. You're going to be laying in a bed. You want to be comfortable. And so you can put it inside a small lanyard in a case, and therefore you can wear it around your neck. You could also, as they have admission vans, as we said, you can put more information on these pies. You could put all the information for a patient on the Raspberry Pi and then have a bracelet. Um, there's a lot of different possibilities, but yes, it would be on the patient and or uh, staff member directly. So um, first off, I can see that you've got your hands dirty on this one, so awesome for that. Thank you. Before Thank I you. jump into my question, please help me validate something. Did you utilize a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth node? Is that how you? Or was it simply Wi Fi? So we only use Wi Fi for this. Right. So our goal was to create a low cost um, edge node that we can <coughs> use the existing infrastructure. So there are mostly Wi Fi access points in a lot of buildings, and Bluetooth would have had to have us set up different sensors within the building, and that would have increased cost. It would increase accuracy, but cost was a big thing for us, so that's why we only used Wi Fi. Something I would invite like you to consider in terms of 2.0 is if with the advancements in Bluetooth mesh, you would be able to get around your lack of access points because they'd be able to detect each other as long as you had a critical minutes. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just a, just a thought. Um, oh, yeah. Do you have anything that, any reason why that wouldn't work? I mean, there's, we Not just really haven't been able to test that far. We were just focused on Wi-Fi just because in this year long time span, that was what we wanted to work and that's what we wanted to work effectively. So I think if we were able to build upon this project, we would definitely take that into consideration as well as other different uh, location technologies. Thank you very much for the heads yeah, up. Thank you. 
Uh, kind of going off this point about uh, Bluetooth, do you guys make any contingencies if, uh, I mean, a LAN uh, input could still work if the Wi-Fi shut down, but what would happen if you're, like, are you guys completely shut down off Wi-Fi and access points if the Wi-Fi is down in the building? Or, or do you have yeah, the system there? will not work without uh, Wi-Fi, okay. and that is unfortunate. Yeah. However, um, I mean, it's what we're relying on, and then you're not really going to be able to access the web page anyway, so yeah. I think their main concern will be, let's get the Wi-Fi back on. And then as soon as it is back on, you can, these nodes will be running, so they will continuously try to push the information. So once it comes back on, it'll push the most recent information. So, you know, they're going to be concerned about that anyways. Dr. Matthew. With uh, hospitals using so much technology, have you considered how this device may conflict with some other technology the patient is wearing? Yes, and what we've talked to Sean Craddock about um, from Centaur RMH is it wouldn't really be an issue unless it were near an MRI machine, because it does have metal, and that'll blow up and shoot metal all over it. That'd be really bad. Um, but because it's like wireless, and because there are already so many wireless devices in that facility, he seems to be under the impression and have faith that it would not be a problem interfering with other technology. However, there is a process that we need to go through oh, yes, before so we can test it in uh -huh. mm -hmm. So he said that he will start the paper. Yes, yeah. We definitely have to get approved before we actually go into the facility. Just that's because it's a medical device and mm -hmm. yeah. that's a whole, you know, field. And you don't have to go through the FDA or any of that No, nothing. Okay. It's like 511, some weird long title for the paperwork. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Sean said it was, it was lengthy and a, a long process. Any other questions? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.